Hi Louise, how are you? How have you been? Yeah, not too bad, thank you, Mary. Um, strange times, as we keep saying. Yes, how about you? Um, I've been okay. I mean, we were talking earlier in the week, weren't we, about the different sort of phases that you go through, I think, with this lockdown and the new circumstances that we find ourselves in. So it's um, been a learning curve and a process of having to open up to what is. Yeah. Um, forcing what one would usually do really yeah it's a great way of looking at it um and, and really staying with what that brings up and i think yeah. that was something we were going to explore um today you know moving on from the noticing to the opening um and then that takes us into a completely different different space um and and means so many different things doesn't it yes yes it does because we were talking about opening and the overwhelm that you can feel in a situation like this is because it is so different, but you're opening up to something which is different. But at the same time, if you're not used to it, we were talking about having a certain kind of framework within which to understand and hold that. Otherwise you just take absolutely everything on and it's not balanced or it's not anchored by any sense of a sort of reasoning over that mm -hmm. so that's quite a good point for us to really start off from i think yes i think so and and like you the word i think you used there was overwhelm and i think <clears throat> there's a definite sense that that people particularly people that i've been speaking to feel totally overwhelmed by what's happening right now um, and that brings up so many more issues too. Um, and this sense of overwhelm I'd like to kind of um, talk about as well in relation to um, my own method of inquiry in, um, in times such as these and, and methods of inquiry that I've been using in the past, you know, like uh, thinking through the heart and Gertian inquiry. And I'm thinking specifically about um, uh, my first interaction with Gertian inquiry with a, a, a plant called groundsel. And I remember when I first met this plant, I was totally speechless, totally overwhelmed. And you know, that idea of overwhelm, it's whatever situation you find yourself in when you open up towards it and there's no, there's no narrative there, there's no precedent there, there's nothing there to hold you. How, yeah. how do you how do you find yourself how do you hold yourself in in that kind of inquiry and i think you know this is really really important for the times that we find ourselves in today absolutely absolutely and i think it's interesting that we don't have a way of doing that in our modern age or postmodern <clears> age because <throat> we've lost so much in the last few hundred years and so it's not a case of finding brand new methods or finding new theories or angles or clever ways of dealing with things it's actually a recovery of something that we've lost and at the same time it's being brought into the presence of your actual experience and it takes us from a place of a theory of experience to experiential and experiencing what is happening mm, definitely um, in the here and the now so frameworks are very important indeed because we don't really have many frameworks that assist us in that way and the frameworks we do have have become um quite peculiar to be honest in some sense of the word yeah definitely so we're all scrabbling around trying to find ways of articulating things that we feel and especially with in your case groundsel when you encountered it which is a beautiful um plant or um weed is yeah. it actually well so-called weed mm. <clears throat> and that flood of initial um joy or wonderment perhaps or almost the sublime which can make us feel completely overwhelmed but then knowing how to sort of ground that in some sort of meaning without losing the experience in its in its beauty 
Yeah, exactly. I was watching something by um, Charles Eisenstein um, this last week, and he was talking about, you know, how do we stand in the whirlwind? And I thought that was such a, a beautiful way of articulating, you know, may, maybe where uh, many of us find ourselves right now. And this idea of, um, so going back to a framework, which for me would be, well, how would the heart see this? And, 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 and at the same time, how would I inquire into this through a kind of Goethean um, lens? Yeah. And it's sort of, um, I think we were talking about this last time, like um, a 180 degree flip, isn't it really? Sort of moving upstream rather than downstream, thinking to use Henry Bortoff's language. Yeah. And making that flip or that turn 180 degrees into a space that actually, uh, an, an opening into that space, but also realizing that that movement in itself is 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 quite brave. Mm. It's a brave yeah. move into somewhere that you don't know. It's a brave move to open up into something that is mysterious and um, unknown. Mm. Um, and it's an, an interruption of the normal. Absolutely. Where we, we don't necessarily reach for a solution. And, and where... Again, Charles Eisenstein says that we actually can't necessarily reach for a solution at the moment because these times are unprecedented. Yes. And it's not grasping for that exploration, but, but a, a holding as much as we can. And I'm not saying these things lightly, but it, it, it's a holding these things or, or how we feel or holding ourselves in that space of the unknown in a kind of open space of curiosity as much as possible, but at the same time honoring how we are feeling in that maelstrom of emotions and all kinds of stuff that's going on for us. It's, it's, this opening is, is, is not easy and it can be very uncomfortable. Absolutely, we were talking about this, picking up from last week, weren't we, about that it's <clears> not an either or, it's a both and. So at the same time, one can be feeling concerns about where your income might be coming from yeah. next or what am I going to do for work since you can't work anymore yeah. and at the same time the earth is responding very strongly towards us and one thing I thought was quite interesting this week or last week was the price of oil mm -hmm. which um, was became less than zero and it was almost as if the earth has said everything you've ever taken out of me you've pillaged and pulled so much out of me now even the stuff that you've taken from me is worth less than nothing and that was felt like a very strong response from the earth and of course that's tough on many 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 levels yeah but um and it's not to say that people aren't suffering and the economy will suffer no doubt um on many different levels mm -hmm. as are individuals but it was very pronounced response I felt from Very. the earth in that way that we've just seen it as a thing as a resource to be used mm. and pulled so much from her and disregarded every sense of living with nature harmoniously and localized we've gone so global that it's become ridiculous and this is the situation that we're in at the moment I think that's a really beautiful observation, Mary. And it really, you know, made me oh stop and, and take a take a breath in. And it's really taking us back to the the title of of what we've termed these dialogues, really. The world is speaking to us. Mm. And how we live then is our reply. So really it, what you've just said is the world is talking to us and and really how we now respond to what she's saying to us mm. is is the difference between continuing the way that we always have done mm -hmm. or really committing to have a conversation with her yes in a way that creates flourishing for 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 all for her and for us it's again, we're back to this both and, aren't we? Absolutely. Um, and, and I think um, this is a really great time. If you, you wouldn't mind me, do you, do you mind me just sharing my PowerPoints the, no. the, about Groundsall? Because it's so personal in terms of what we're talking about. So as we're talking about um, sort of opening, um, the, the, the picture on the left-hand side is, is Groundsall. And um, she is seen as a weed. 
However, my experience with her, um, I no longer see her as a weed. I, I see her as a sentient, growing, beautiful um, being that um, is just as much a part of the world and the earth as I am. Mm. Um, and the reason why I see that is because when I was working with Gertie and Inquiry, um, it, it was sort of about making an imaginal turn. So moving out of the, the rational, logical brain and more towards uh, opening to the idea that it's possible to converse with another being, another sentient being. And not that you're losing um, rationality or critique, but that actually you're opening up towards a different way of being in the world that includes the rational critique, if you see what I'm saying. Absolutely. So this is why I'm sort of got the title there, opening heart and head, because I see, I take the heart through a, a kind of um, James Hillman lens, Henry Corbin lens, which is that the heart is an organ of imaginal perception. Mm. And for Corbin and for Hillman, the, the heart itself is the place that receives the images of the world. So the world speaks to us through images. And those images we understand through uh, symbolic language and metaphor and poetic language. And so that seeing that way is sort of like an imaginal turn into an imaginal consciousness where you could imagine that, yes, okay, the world is talking to us because if that's the way she speaks, then that is the way that I must receive her. I sink down into my heart first, to use Robert Romanishin's terms, and then move that understanding up to the head so I can um, analyze that or look at that a little bit further, but then pass it back to the heart so I can continue that conversation with whatever it is I'm in relationship with. Mm -hmm. And so this imaginal consciousness uses the intuition, the senses, the sens sensuality, um, imagination, intuition, and it's open and expansive. The thing about it is it waits in the not knowing, mm. um, inviting another, whatever that other is, into relationship. And this way of knowing also allows a depth and paradox and the both and, which is what we were talking about last week. So you're not losing anything. And I think we said this last week, didn't we? We're not losing anything yeah. by doing this. We're just bringing something else alongside to have its rightful place alongside all of these different ways of knowing the world and all these different ways of knowing that we can be in the world. Mm. I think that's so powerful, Louise, as well, because um, it reminded me of, again, a quote from Hillman, where he talks about insight and self-knowing and self-knowledge, as have all the ancient texts from ancient mm. Greece and all the way through history, really. But he said it's not about just sort of sitting there and closing your eyes and turning in on yourself again and again. Actually, it's much more powerful to bring your attention to something out there in the world that you can perceive and engage in your mode of imaginal perception with yeah. that so-called thing. <laughs> and it's not a thing, of course, but it's a beautiful plant. It's a um, ground soil that you found um, and it's a very powerful way of um, opening up different modes of perception and knowing. But it is that opening because you have to bring something of yourself to it um, through and out, again, through this outward observation and attention, mm -hmm. as well as a receptivity, which is the opening within you. Again, it's that both and. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And, and again, you know, like you say, th this isn't anything new. This is, this is very ancient wisdom that, you know, has, has been sort of passed on to us through different scholars throughout history. So Henry Corbin himself was particularly influenced by um, Ibn Arabi um, and who was particularly influenced by, you know, platonic thinking. So these ideas aren't new. It's just that um, they're being brought back into consciousness, into awareness, um, because now more than ever, we need these more expansive, open ways of seeing and, and being in the world. Mm. So how would something like that look at for you? So would you actually have gone into an, act an actual 
exercise with it in a sense of engaged looking and seeing and perception yeah. and then the rational critique would come in <clears throat> afterwards where you're grounding your insights and experiences in a sort of larger context of meaning exactly yeah so just to move on to uh, what would happen in in Gertian inquiry so um, this was um, something that I was asked to do as part of my um, master's course um, and Goethe himself uh, the, obviously the poet Johann von Goethe um, said that his idea was that everything is in, is in the phenomenon itself there is nothing hidden and what what we need to do as human beings we need to carefully cultivate our mode of perception which requires a fundamental shift of perception 180 degrees in a different direction upstream mm. so what you do is you engage your rational mind and your sensory experience your imagination your feeling your tasting your intuiting and he had a two-step methodology and which i put on the slide here so the first step is exact sensorial perception where you come into relationship, you come into relationship with your subject of inquiry as clearly and deeply as possible without preformed mental models, theories and classifications. And you just sit there in the space with this other being. And step two is where you move away from that being or you just close your eyes and you recreate the experience in your imagination to come to know um, the subject of your inquiry better so you're, you're sort of really then reinforcing it in your in your body in your mind's eye in your heart if you like and so this two-way approach means that it's kind of like a participatory movement mm. the plant in this sense is talking to you you're mm. recreating it in your mind and you're going back to it and you're saying to the plant is this the way that you're representing is this the way you're presenting yourself Mm. Um, and the plant would you sort of look again and the plant would sort of say to you yeah but look a bit deeper and this is the way that I'm presenting myself and then you notice more you notice more as you as you do this two-way process it's like um, a two-way conversation really it's very yes. very powerful mm. um, and it sounds now as I'm talking about it like it's really really easy um, but actually, it's, it's not the easiest thing to do in the world when you've been educated in a, into a particular way of um, knowing the world itself. So when I first started to do this with Groundsall, I ended up just being in this place of overwhelm. I think you used those words before, Mary. Totally mm. overwhelmed. Didn't know what I was doing. Didn't have any words to describe what I was doing. I thought that I was doing something really silly to start off with. Um, but the interesting thing was that after the fourth or fifth day of me just sitting and looking at Groundsall, something happened. And it was like a revelatory experience really for me. And I suddenly had this sense of the aliveness of Groundsall. She became alive to me. It was something that shifted totally. And I saw that because of the reciprocal relationships that she had with the environment that she was in and with life itself, she was a living being. And so she actually gave voice to the warming rays of the sun and the richness of the earth and the life giving power of rain. I actually felt that viscerally in every part of my body and I know that sounds really simple or yes of course that's of course what happens but it was a sense that I was participating in the beingness of Groundsel if that makes any sense to you it was a total shift of seeing and out of that overwhelm and out of that speechlessness came this sense of conversation and being at one with this plant and I knew in that moment that that plant was talking to me, that Groundsel was talking to me and, and Groundsel was responding because she, she sort of showed me then these kind of all these different cycles in life itself on a deeply philosophical level. It changed my whole life and my whole trajectory and how I thought about nature from that point. Hmm. Gosh, that's remarkable. 
that's absolutely beautiful and how frequently or how rarely do we experience something like that i think frequently as children we do it all the time i think children are so in tune with that and i think it was betjeman john betjeman who said um childhood is filled with sights and sounds i can't remember the whole thing until the dark hour of reason creeps in um and children talk to their dolls or their things or they talk to themselves or imaginary friends or animals pets plants all the time and then we're told to sort of grow up not be so silly and become uber rational people and this whole way of knowing gets completely blotted out yeah but like you said you don't have to lose anything it's an adding to it yeah definitely um and and it certainly was a sense of something being added it was like i felt more alive that actually the heart half-life this kind of anorexic life narrow view of life that i've been living in there was so much more that was open to me that i was able to experience with nature and it, it sort of helped me to develop a, a kind of an ecological consciousness yeah. the sense that nature plants animals are just as important as human beings you know it, it sort of and i knew that i knew that already but it was like i was then put on the same level playing field as the rest of nature and i can't tell you how that shifted my whole outlook on life really it was just like i was being held by um life itself that was like your i suppose it was what um the thinking about frameworks and so forth if you look at the four senses hermeneutic that would be the your tropological turn wouldn't it <clears throat> where you cross that threshold really and how did, so was that while you were at schumacher that this was an exercise that you yeah you did your... yeah so i so i did it quite a lot then you know once i got past the there was five days where i was totally in a place of not knowing and we mentioned this at the beginning of the dialogue not knowing my my normal was interrupted i was trying not to grasp for an explanation i was in the mystery of the not knowing what on earth was i doing what was his conversation was a, is about what was his conversation about but i stayed with it you know that was the thing i stayed with it and then all of a sudden something broke through which was this kind of experience that i had with groundsel that that shifted my whole attention and my relationship with the world and I think, you know, if we're talking about, you know, what's happening in, in the present times, we are sitting with something that's totally unprecedented. And, and I, you know, I don't think necessarily that it's a great idea to rush towards solutions because the old way of being in the world wasn't necessarily serving mm. many, particularly not nature and the earth. Mm. And so how do we, the question that I'm kind of sitting with through a Gertian lens and, and through a, a kind of heart-centered lens, if I, I sort of move on to uh, heart sense and the model that I've been working with in my own PhD, you know, how do we sit in the, the, in the not knowing, in the discomfort long enough for something different to break through that could potentially offer us or offer all things, all phenomena, the opportunity to flourish rather than the few. Mm. And, and so really working with Gertin inquiry and heart sense, and I believe that the two are intricately linked. Mm. This idea of insightful perception and considered discernment regarding daily life, which is a definition that I've, I've developed for heart sense, using the wisdom and benevolent qualities of the heart. Um, really if you bring Gertin inquiry and heart sense together in that sense and rest in the open space of the not knowing where could we find ourselves you know what could break through 
what has the potential to how does the world in that space that we've created for it how could she speak to us what could she say to us and how then do we reply you know so so this opening is is really uncomfortable but if we can stay with it long enough what could have the opportunity to come forward to reveal itself in that mm. conversation yeah that's really beautiful it's when you were saying about the um the opening and it shifts you out of a place of security and so many posts i've seen on facebook or through friends messages and so forth and, and i'm i've said it as well i'm sure you know this is getting boring now when are we going to be able to get out and see people and meet face to face i think it's actually the social aspect that we've missed more than anything because yeah. we are social creatures and we need each other and if anything it's brought me to the attention certainly mm -hmm. of of my friends and how much i miss them and mm -hmm the lovely things we can say to each other even though we can't physically see each other um but that it brings you to this state of vulnerability as well yeah. the opening and it makes one feel very vulnerable and we're not used to feeling vulnerable and we always want to cover it up because we are rational human beings who live in postmodernism, and you know we're intelligent westerners and you know we've got this whole sort of history behind us that pushes you up to this place that where you think you have to be um in control all the time mm. and um seem to be doing you know the right thing and so forth um which impedes on our ability to be able to as you say here mm. open to perceiving in another way and just allowing that space to remain actually this whole space i would relate very closely to breath Mm -hmm. the, the, the earth needs to breathe again and breath if you think about it is our inhalation and our exhalation yeah. it is the threshold itself that sits between our life here in our body on earth and our not being here in our body and somewhere else yeah and that breathing that breath does have to have some space and the earth certainly needs to be able to breathe again she's been choked and suffocated for a very long time yeah so i think just allowing that space and i use breath as a as a metaphor here but allowing it to just breathe and find its own rhythm and slow to a pace of a breath rather than that we're always sprinting all the time as most of us run through life yeah so there's a lot of beautiful things that can come from that and really i suppose what we're hoping is yes each one of us can make our own you know i'm certainly not here waving a flag saying i'm going to change the world because i i can't and um i can just be aware of certain things and within our own way of doing things we can make changes that we feel will impact on the earth in a positive way um but it needs to sort of happen in a in a mass shift where we become very aware of what's so wrong and this sense of opening in the heart sense that you mentioned is and go really into is is a beautiful way of being able to navigate that mm. pathway yeah. through there. yeah i mean it's definitely something mary that is is supporting me at the moment in you know having conversations with seeing what's happening with the world hearing her speak to me like you say about the fact that she'd been choked by you know everything that we were doing to her and you know how how do i hear her cry um and how do i now sit with how i move into the world be you know post covid 19 and and these frameworks like we say having these frameworks are very helpful so the gertin inquiry and the heart sense for me are very helpful ways of being able to sit and listen to the world talking to me to coronavirus talking to me um to my own ideas and anxieties talking to me and, and holding them all together mm. in some kind of messy space because it is messy <laughs> the space that we're in right now mm. um and just to, to to be in that space of opening and waiting 
Yes. Yeah. And, and, and every I'm, day I think you can take a breath, you know, you can breathe. It's, it's, um, even if one is in a state of panic or as you said, anxiety and not the not knowing, and there are very real things that are causing that. This mm. is not, this is not a, an imagined state. No. This is very real. And um, it's based on circumstances outside of ourselves that we currently have no control over. And so that sense of being able to just remind yourself every day, I have light on my body and I can breathe air. And as long as there's some food to eat for today, I'm okay. Yeah. And we don't know what might happen tomorrow at the moment, but we can start to think a little bit towards that yeah and so yeah. i was kind of wondering um you know now i've shared the frameworks really that that help me and support me what kind of things mary make sense to you at this particular time i think a lot of um what we said in the beginning about this complete slowing down <coughs> of the place and what we called normal wasn't so normal anymore and, and doesn't feel normal anymore and there are certainly moments where I'll not panic, but think, goodness, you know, I wonder what might happen tomorrow or next week that I just don't know. But I'm actually becoming quite used to being in this not knowing space. Mm. Um, and a lot of reflection for me, um, going back to sort of reflecting on childhood and, and so forth, not in a kind of overly sentimental way, but certainly it feels like a very real going back sense as well to a time of life or in certainly a pace of life when what I'm experiencing now feels very much like my childhood in mm. terms of the the noise has stopped a lot and the busyness has stopped and the chaotic sort of just people running around everywhere doing this doing that a mm. hundred things a day to do everyone's always driving towards something or yeah and, and, and you know this sort of thing and um and it's very nice to sit and not have to engage with that. But my own frameworks, really, I suppose, drawing on what I spoke to, what we spoke about last week, and thinking about how our perceptions or of, of nature and of art really help to shift and awaken something which we've forgotten for so long and it's an, an open to, which is not an easy, easy thing to do. Mm. And um, what really struck me actually was this, this sense of the opening and the overwhelm, which I suppose one would say is, is the heart opening and the mind opening in a certain way, but the importance of also being able to ground that and have a sort of tension at the other end of the sort of rational yeah. and the um, reasoning which might come from that. And it brought to mind again classical art for me which obviously the renaissance was reviving and i thought about i'm just going to share my screen um all, lots of things really the the fact that works of art many years ago were understood as being alive and animate in the same way that you talk about nature mm. and that you're not just looking at a work of art or you're not just looking at a flower it's also looking back at you and that two-way sense that you, you are being seen mm -hmm. and that being seen helps to open up again in a, in a particular way. And it also brought me to the sense of, um, there's a, a tension I think that we have to deal with when with, with nature, with anything we see of beauty or with a work of art in that, the meaning of the work of art doesn't necessarily just sit behind it, but it is in it as well. And it's in that experience of it. So we're not just theorizing about an experience. And I just wanted to bring up this um, image of one of the statues that was on the Parthenon in Greece by a, a sculptor called Phidias, but even headless. Um, the goddess has this sense within her that she's alive, that it's a moving 
living being in there but really that can only come come alive in your imagination and in your response to it and it's not pointing only to something symbolic beyond it but it's also embodied in it as well and Rodin who was a French sculptor loved the statues from ancient Greece and particularly loved to visit England and London and went to the British Museum and looked at all the wonderful statues there and he said he said about this particular statue that the goddess's pose is so serene so majestic that they seem to participate in something grand that we do not see over them reigns in effect the great mystery immaterial eternal reason obeyed by all nature and i thought it was such a beautiful mm. reminder of how something that we see or a work of art could have been created based on principles of not, I don't want to say philosophy because it makes it sound like such a static thing, yeah. but an understanding of the cosmos in a different way and of nature, which was absolutely seen as, as a, an embodied being. And her expression is in what you see. It's not just behind what you see. It's in it as well. And, I, and it brought to mind as well Myron's Discobolus or Discus Thrower, who who was an, another sculptor around the same time as Phidias, which is the goddess that we've just seen. And these are Roman marble copies of his discus thrower, where the proportions and the, and the harmony within the body and um, its stance are all directed by certain cosmic ratios and so forth, which I won't really go into now. But the original was bronze and these are all marble copies. And this, the original would have been the discus thrower looking back mm -hmm. towards his discus. But what I thought was so interesting about these, this work of art, this statue, is that he's perfectly balanced asymmetrically. He's not symmetrical, he's, he's asymmetrical. And this shape here of his arms and you can draw the shape of a bow here mm -hmm. perfectly through his arms and the shape of his, his curve and then the straight line between the two hands. And it brought to mind, it sort of stood as a metaphor really. So this brought to mind a passage actually from Heraclitus who was a pre-Socratic philosopher. And Heraclitus says in his fragments, that's all we have of his writing, he said the cosmos works by harmony of tensions like the lyre and the bow. And I thought that was a very relevant image for us today in going what we're going through, that we have this sort of tension of the pulling towards something that we might have to live in a different way and an old way that we're going to have to let go of. But there's a sort of harmony somewhere that we can find between that tension that pull and again as you said Louise it is is it it, it is in that in between mm. it's not it's that and that it's an in between that grows from that participation yeah. in that and it also brought to mind um, Dr Ian McGilchrist's work where he talks about the two hemispheres of the brain which attend to the world in different ways and it's not what they do it's how they do it mm. and they're both responsible for many things which are the same and Heraclitus is a philosopher that um, Dr. McGilchrist quotes quite frequently, but he, he says about Heraclitus that he doesn't advise a turning inwards in order to discover the nature of reality, but a patient and careful attention to the phenomenal world. And I thought that was very relevant for us today as well. Yeah. He <laughs> mentioned both as well, and this is a quote from, from um, Ian's book. He says, the taut string it's two ends pulling apart under the opposing under opposing forces that for bow or lyre is what gives it its vital strength or virtue is the perfect expression of a dynamic rather than a static equilibrium and i thought that was really relevant for us to think of today in what we're going through yeah. in that it's a it's a dynamic place that we find ourselves in it's not static it's constantly moving 
And this is a beautiful reminder, yeah. this quote from Heraclitus of that. And I very much always like to see that in a work of art or try to try to see what the metaphorical meaning is in a work of art, which doesn't skip over the beauty or the physical perception of it, but that it embodies a number of different things on a number of different mm. levels all at the same time. Yeah. So that really is, is the opening as well is the sense of the bow and the lyre then you can't get that taut string and the tension between the two if it remains closed. Mm -hmm. So again, it has to open. So there's this beautiful sort of opening of something, but within that there's a harmony and an equilibrium. And I think that is also reflected in the analogy of the right and left hemisphere mm -hmm. of the brain, or as you would say, you know, and through the heart that the right hemisphere is not just something that sits within the brain. The mind is something much larger than that, mm -hmm. but we need the two. And yeah. again, that's another framework. And I think looking at these ancient classical works of art, that these principles were very much understood mm -hmm. in that way and embodied through the works of art that without having a rational grounding of some sort this work of art wouldn't be able to stand up <laughs> yeah. you know the ideas might be there but it would be swimming around in a sort of you know mess of marble on the floor <laughs> but but the fact that it's it's come into being um means that we do need to have a grounding of some sort as well as um something much bigger mm -hmm. than that and that the two can come together and when they do they actually create something rather beautiful. Well, I think that's, you know, fascinating, Mary. And I think, you know, really today was looking at um, moving beyond noticing into mm. opening. Yes. And, you know, really what we wanted to try and do was explore the frameworks that, that we each use mm. to, to help us to, to maybe navigate life in a, in a particular way. Um, and, and you've really beautifully shown how your framework can be applied you know philosophically to to your life and 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 the things that you're experiencing mm. you know in in the same way that um looking at uh, a plant through gertian inquiry and through you know applying heart sense i can kind of look at well what does that mean in terms of what's happening in, for me in the world today mm. Mm. So they're very helpful ways of, of trying to, to, to hold, maybe particularly the, the, what we're experiencing right now in our world with, with coronavirus and, and being on lockdown. Yeah. Um, so I think if they've been able to, um, you know, inspire or, or offer any support to, you know, people who are watching this, mm. then, you know, that's, that can only be a good thing. Um, to sort of yeah. see a, a bigger, more expansive picture in terms of we're part of something wider, we're part of something more expansive. Yeah. Um, and when we see ourselves that way, between these push-pulls, between life and death, between yeah. these opposites, between these tensions, yeah. how, do, how do we navigate that? How do we hold that? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so that it's not always comfortable doing so i think we always want to <coughs> run for something which feels fluffy and nice mm. and it isn't necessarily going to but but it's through that sense of tension again it's that sort of pull between the two of something that there is a harmony that mm. you can find within that it's it's that it's being able to hold a number of different levels and accept different things all at the same time yeah without feeling that you're well we're not in control anyway of, of many things we're in control of of what we do with ourselves and our bodies and how we speak and all these things that we are in control of but we aren't in control of whether there's going to be sunshine rain or an earthquake tomorrow and we're not in control of um certain pandemics at the moment as we that we are experiencing or how the earth might respond but it, I think it's a sense of um, acceptance as well. And in, in the acceptance, there is an opening 
too but I think always to feel that there is that we have it seems like such an odd thing for us perhaps today in modern times but to know that we are part of something much bigger that you can't really know <laughs> so yeah. it's nice not knowing that but you can expect you can feel it when you engage in your sense of experience with nature or with a beautiful work of art or be inspired or moved by beauty because so many people go through life and never notice a beautiful painting or a plant that might just grab your attention in a certain way or the light in someone else's eyes or face or so these things are important to notice because they are what makes us who we are and make us human and experience being human and again i think that comes through your sense of the heart and mm -hmm. being in the heart that it's not all us being in the head and thinking and thinking about everything all the time but it's bringing that into our experience yeah yeah there's a there's a deeper layer really i think mm -hmm. is what we're talking about yeah yes yeah yeah, no, it's been really fascinating, Louise. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, thank you so much. So next time we speak, um, our next session is um, about... So week three is grieving. So we're looking at, um, because we've been exploring different ways of knowing, noticing and opening, but also in that, in bringing that into the conversation, we're acknowledging that other ways of knowing have been open to us but we've been, been educated to silence them and i think it's important to actually make room for this loss to grieve for the loss and to consider how this loss might have affected us and the many many different layers of all of this so we're going to be uh, looking at uh, grieving uh, mm. in our next conversation mm. lovely okay all right very much look forward to that Definitely, Mary. And keep safe. Yes, you too. Thanks, Louise. Take, Take care. Bye-bye.